Yes, for, for Italian. Uh, English too. Okay. Buon pomeriggio, good afternoon. Buon pomeriggio. I will speak in Italian. Vi do il benvenuto a questa sessione plenaria del settimo congresso mondiale contro la pena di morte che si concentrerà sull'impegno delle imprese e del settore privato. Quando ci impegniamo per l'abolizione della pena di morte serviamo un obiettivo molto più ampio di promozione dei diritti umani e della giustizia. La nostra lotta per l'abolizione non riguarda solo il salvataggio di, di vite basato sulla convinzione che il diritto alla vita e alla dignità umana dovrebbe essere condiviso universalmente. La nostra battaglia riguarda anche le condizioni carcerarie. Si tratta di servire la giustizia ed evitare la terribile tragedia della sua malamministrazione, che comporta danni irreparabili e irreversibili. Riguarda la protezione dei minorenni in carcere e il rispetto del processo equo. Si tratta di combattere la tortura e i maltrattamenti. Riguarda la protezione di individui in tutto il mondo, la cui povertà è fonte particolare di vulnerabilità di fronte alle ingiustizie generate dai fallimenti nei sistemi giudiziari e dello Stato di diritto. Si tratta di promuovere una cultura dei diritti umani, una cultura della giustizia, della compassione e della cura. A questo proposito vorrei esprimere la mia profonda preoccupazione per, la crescente, per il crescente ricorso dell'Egitto alla pena di morte, comprese le esecuzioni della scorsa settimana di nove uomini a cui è stato negato un processo equo. L'uso dell'Egitto della pena capitale contraddice chiaramente il valore attribuito all'obiettivo condiviso di mettere la gente delle nostre regioni al centro dei nostri sforzi e di investire nella stabilità, come affermato nella dichiarazione di Sharm el Sheikh, del Summit della Lega Araba e degli Stati membri dell'Unione Europea, il 25 febbraio. Fino a poco tempo fa l'impegno contro la pena di morte era per lo più limitato ai difensori specializzati del movimento abolizionista. Sono convinto che non sia sufficiente circoscrivere questa battaglia a stanze piene di avvocati per i diritti umani, attivisti e ONG specializzate, diplomatici e funzionari governativi. Ecco perché accolgo con estremo favore il fatto che oggi ascolteremo una varietà di oratori sui diversi modi in cui il settore privato si impegna sulla questione della pena capitale e su come possiamo incoraggiare una cooperazione più forte e strategie congiunte tra le imprese e il movimento abolizionista. Abbiamo già alcuni casi positivi. Sappiamo tutti come è diventato progressivamente più difficile negli Stati Uniti implementare la pena capitale, poiché i singoli Stati non sono stati in grado di ottenere i farmaci usati nelle iniezioni letali. Alcune aziende farmaceutiche hanno in effetti fatto da battistrade e hanno riconosciuto l'imperativo morale e imprenditoriale di non essere complici delle esecuzioni. Altri forse hanno esitato o deviato la responsabilità, ma hanno ricevuto segnali molto chiari dall'Unione Europea quando abbiamo adottato il cosiddetto regolamento sugli strumenti di tortura che ha stabilito severi controlli sulle esportazioni e ha vietato l'esportazione di prodotti farmaceutici europei che potrebbero essere utilizzati nelle esecuzioni. 
Sono lieto anche che il Parlamento europeo abbia svolto il suo ruolo in questo campo, sostenendo la necessità di colmare possibili lacune. Tuttavia è chiaro che dobbiamo anche trovare nuovi metodi. Non possiamo lasciare il nobile obiettivo dell'abolizione semplicemente alle organizzazioni internazionali, ai politici e agli esperti legali. Il mondo più proattivo e innovativo che ha il potenziale per diventare un vero punto di svolta è quello di unire le forze con il settore privato. Dobbiamo lavorare insieme e imparare gli uni dagli altri. Dobbiamo guardare oltre la questione delle catene di approvvigionamento delle aziende farmaceutiche e iniziare a includere la pena di morte nelle strategie e nella responsabilità sociale delle imprese. Dobbiamo pensare alla difesa, alla campagna di base, al dialogo e al potere persuasivo dei leader aziendali e dei cittadini. Non cercano solo marchi, prodotti e servizi, ma desiderano essere consumatori responsabili e cittadini attivi che vogliono fare la cosa giusta e agire per difendere la dignità umana e i diritti umani. Noi, il Parlamento europeo, siamo pronti a lavorare con chiunque sia disposto a cogliere questa grande opportunità per andare avanti. Dobbiamo anche prendere in considerazione il nostro kit di strumenti dell'Unione europea, utilizzare il regime preferenziale, l'SPG Plus, dell'Unione Europea come leva efficiente ed efficace per far progredire i diritti umani con i Paesi partner, anche verso la moratoria e l'abolizione e intensificare il monitoraggio dei casi di pena di morte. Dobbiamo inoltre utilizzare il contesto imprenditoriale dei diritti umani e creare partnership con tutti gli attori, comprese le imprese. Oggi sentiremo dai vari oratori diversi modi in cui il settore privato si impegna sulla questione della pena capitale e su come potremo incoraggiare una più stretta collaborazione tra il settore e il movimento abolizionista. Il settore pubblico può fornire un quadro solido per incentivare e sostenere le imprese che assumono un atteggiamento etico sulla questione. A sua volta il settore privato è probabilmente una delle fonti di potere per il cambiamento più sottoutilizzate e non riconosciute. In quest'Aula parliamo spesso del potenziale, del potere aziendale di essere complice delle violazioni dei diritti umani e la, condanna, e la condotta responsabile delle imprese è diventata un problema posto in primo piano da parte nostra. È giunto il momento di sfruttare il potere aziendale, il suo raggio d'azione, le risorse e la missione per una buona causa. Il settore delle aziende è pieno di persone con spiccata inventiva e con una mentalità imprenditoriale responsabile, capace di trovare soluzioni innovative e creative. Gli uomini d'affari possono essere tra i membri più persuasivi della nostra comunità globale. Il mio messaggio finale, quindi, per voi è che i diritti umani siano affari di tutti. Abbiamo bisogno di voi come agente al servizio del bene pubblico, al servizio dei diritti umani universali. Buon lavoro. Thank you very much. Grazie tanto for that stirring introduction to this topic. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to be moderating this panel, which I think is going to be a really stimulating discussion of the way in which the business sector can uh, interact with civil society and work towards achieving our goal of ending the death penalty. I have some esteemed uh, panelists here. We have panelists from the business sector who we will hear from first off. We have experts and academics and diplomats who've all been working in different capacities on this subject over many, many years. And I won't keep you long before handing over to our first, uh, in fact, to the video performance, which we'll have shortly from Richard Branson. Um, but I just wanted to make a distinction in terms of framing before we begin, because we talk a lot in the third sector about 
businesses and human rights. And there's lots of different language that's used around there. There's uh, corporate social responsibility, business and human rights, um, citizenship. There's all sorts of different terms. And there are also different business interests and different kinds of businesses that may or may not engage with different human rights issues. And it might be helpful for us to think of uh, the subject that we're dealing with here and the way we engage with companies in two ways. There are companies and we'll hear from some of them on the panel, who choose to engage on matters relating to human right, rights, and in this case on the death penalty, because uh, it is part of their decision-making process as a business. They've got interests that mean that they themselves want to be active on this topic, and perhaps we'll hear from uh, Lush and the other businesses on exactly what motivates them to get involved on the death penalty that might be quite removed from their business activities. These companies, uh, stand not in opposition but separate to companies who engage on human rights issues because they are in some way directly or indirectly involved in the human rights issue in question. So we heard uh, Antonio Panzeri talk about the pharmaceutical industry. The reason they have got involved on death penalty questions is that their products were being misused in capital punishment and it wasn't an obvious or an easy uh, route to get them to be as engaged as they are, but there was a, a hook for that engagement. And uh, Suna will talk to us a little bit later about the responsibilities on companies who are directly or indirectly engaged in a potential human rights abuse and, and what they should be doing to investigate and mitigate those potential impacts. But I think that distinction is quite important for anybody who's considering engaging with the business sector because there are uh, different reasons why a company might want to talk about this issue and there are different uh, ways, therefore, of engaging with those companies. So I think we're going to start with a presentation from Richard Branson, who was the founder of the Virgin Group and who has been very active and vocal on the death penalty through campaigns um, and through his foundation Virgin Unite, which supports a wide range of social justice projects, and he also writes blogs and speaks out uh, on the issue in individual cases. Well, hello, everybody. It's a great privilege to address the Seventh World Congress against the death penalty. As you know, I have long advocated for the universal abolition of the death penalty. I consider it a barbaric and inhumane practice that deserves no place in modern society. Well, while there's been consistent progress in ending capital punishment around the world over the last decades, executions continue in far too many countries. And more often than not, those executions are the result of arbitrary and unfair trials, lacking due process, and other basic protections under the law. There's no question the death penalty is a deeply flawed and deeply immoral punishment. And against what many of its proponents argue, it fails to deliver justice or act as a deterrent against crime. To make things worse, recent developments in the Philippines and Sri Lanka show that the death penalty continues to be used as a political bargaining chip around the world, particularly during the election season when political leaders seek to bolster their crime-fighting credentials. It brings to mind the words my friend Salil Shetty, the former Secretary General of the Amnesty International. Strong leaders execute justice, not people. Salil said, and I couldn't agree more. But the last year has also seen positive developments. I think I speak for us all in welcoming the Malaysian government's plan to abolish the death penalty and Iran's removal of the death sentence for a number of drug-related crimes. Thankfully, I see more and more businesses waking up to the need to speak out on these issues, and I commend companies like Lush, who have taken the lead in bringing the fight against the death penalty to a wider audience. My opposition to the death penalty is, at its heart, a moral opposition, but I can also see other compelling reasons why business should get involved. From the perspective of an entrepreneur and investor, I think capital punishment is a strong indicator of a country's approach to governance, to fairness and the rule of law. It also tells us a lot about misguided priorities and a lack of fiscal responsibility. 
while the moral argument against the death penalty alone should be strong enough, these are good reasons why business leaders everywhere should, should become global advocates for universal abolition. It's time that the businesses, in collaboration with civil society and abolitionistic governments, step up to deliver a concerted, collective effort that will end the use of the death penalty once and for all. In my heart, I know the death penalty is on its way out, and I like to think the generation of my grandchildren will one day view the thought of killing a fellow human being in the name of justice as absurd and offensive. And without the tireless work of each and every one of you, that world won't become a reality. So I thank you all for your tireless and often difficult work and wish you all a productive meeting over the coming days. I, for one, am on your side. Cheers. Thank you. Our thanks to Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson, for that very, very helpful intervention. Um, and he has been extremely active on, on that point in a number of US states and has made the point there, and we've heard about the pharmaceutical industry, he's made the point that states which continue to or seek to undermine the contracts that these pharmaceutical companies have entered into to protect their products from misuse and executions creates a really hostile climate for businesses to operate. And I think using arguments like that and broadening out the discussion from one industry to a broad sector is uh, obviously going to be very helpful in terms of influencing decision makers who care about the economic investment of companies in, in their states and countries. So next, we have the pleasure of hearing from Carleen Pickard who uh, is, works on social, environmental, and animal justice campaigns for Lush, Fresh Handmade Cosmetics. And Lush, as you've heard from Sir Richard Branson, has been extremely active on the death penalty as well, and indeed is, a, is an industry leader on campaigns uh, on, on that topic. I, at Reprieve, have, have worked with Lush in the UK on some of their campaigns on behalf of individuals like Andy Sege, who was on death row in Ethiopia uh, and released following four years of active campaigning. And we are extremely grateful to Lush uh, for all of their support on these campaigns. So without further ado, I will <coughs> hand over to Carleen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Carlene Pickard. I work at Lush Fresh Handmade Cosmetics. I'm very pleased to be here um, and to share our experience as a, as a business campaigning for the abolition of the death penalty. And as I begin, I would thank, send out a huge thank you from all of us at Lush in North America. So thank you to the organizers of putting, the organizers of this Congress. Uh, I'm, I'm quite humbled to be here and I would want to thank, I would want to start by thanking everybody who has, who has supported our journey at Lush uh, around the death penalty and, and getting to a place where we are firmly um, on the side of abolition. There have been, um, you know, so many people who have shared stories with us, not only of their experience, but also to inform the work that we did at Lush. Um, personally, those folks are also the people who, who really motivate me every day. I'm just always in awe and, again, incredibly humbled um, by the folks who work towards abolition, some of the smartest, strategic, and most compassionate people that I've ever had the opportunity to work with. I think, as um, Raphael said this morning, to me, all of you have become people whose passion explicitly shows that nothing, nothing, nothing can trump love. So your work has really, really set uh, the groundwork for us to be in a position to do what we, what we did and will continue to do. So to just back up, um, we are a soap and body care company. Um, for those of you that, that haven't had the pleasure of going into one of our stores, we were founded in the UK about 25 years ago 
And we have something that's called like our we believe statement. So we believe in things like long candlelit baths. We believe in folks sharing showers. We believe in happy people making happy soap. And we believe in making our moms proud. We have um, products which are fresh with little or no preservatives, uh, either no packaging or, tiny, or very, very small packaging, 100% vegetarian. We are responsible for our supply chain and including um, that no ingredient or product, no ingredient that we use or no product that we ever made um, has ever been tested on animals. One of the tenets of our existing is to end animal testing forever. So I work for the North American part of the business and we have 250 sort of storefronts in Canada and the United States. Over 200 of those are in the US and as a business for Canada and the US, we employ about 8,500 people, both in the retail and manufacturing. So we also believe in, I was talking about our we believe statement. Um, we also believe in giving customers the opportunity to make a difference. We have a hand and body lotion, which is called Charity Pot, and is up on the screen there. And 100% of what the customer pays goes into a charitable giving fund that, um, that we then use, that we then sort of give out to grassroots organizations all around the world. Last year, Charity Pot in North America funded about 400 organizations and about 8 million customer dollars. So again, that's just from one year in terms of giving, or that thing about giving our customers the ability to make a difference. Those are folks that are entrusting us last year with $8 million to give back out to small grassroots groups that are um, really working to make a change. They also, the organizations, once they're funded, sort of show up on those lids, um, which becomes relevant when I talk about our death penalty campaign. But it's the way that we can maximize the way that we talk to customers um, about what their purchases can do, and also to really talk about the work that our partner organizations are doing. So of this funding, about 60% of it for us stays in North America, and about 40% out to the rest of the world. So we also believe um, that we as a brand can have a difference. So we've always been a campaigning company. We use our digital and brick and mortar platforms to highlight and showcase issues that are important to us. So this means from time to time in between our marketing campaigns where we talk about Mother's Day or Easter or Valentine's or something, we'll use our shop windows and fundamentally more importantly our staff to advocate with the millions of customers that cross into our shops every week. So we've campaigned to welcome refugees from Syria. We've campaigned to keep fossil fuels in the ground, an end to the trophy hunting of grizzly bears, and then in 2017 to call for the abolition of the death penalty in the United States. So we felt, um, when we first started thinking about this, we felt that the problems with the criminal justice system in the United States were becoming more and more apparent. And we became convinced that the abolition of the death penalty is a core requirement to achieving just reform, but also that is one of the most urgent. At that time, it was also clear to us that in the United States, the death penalty is ending, with executions at that time at an all-time low, with sentencing also historically low, and with the public opposition to the death penalty at an all-time high. So I don't say those three things in order to say that we felt it was a safe time to be, talking, to be taking an abolition, abolitionist stand, but we believed that it was time because the organizations in the US that we spoke to said how it was important to them to have a corporation to step into that space and to become a, pub a public ally. And that the opportunity that we had to push out so, such a message to our audience and our customers would be a benefit to the movement. And then Trump was elected. So maintaining that forward momentum of abolition felt like it was just that much more urgent. So the campaign ran for about 10 days. Our national partner was the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty because of their strong connections to state level organizations. And with the help of NCADP, we also funded 10 abolition organizations through the Charity Pop program that I was talking about earlier, including Witness to Innocence, who of course you all are familiar with many of the exoneree members of WTI and Death Penalty Focus. We also made a short film called Exonerated, featuring Kwame Ajamu, who some of you might know as well, because the story of people convicted for crimes they did not, convict, they did not commit is such an essential part of the story in the United States. I think we heard about how storytelling was so, is so important, and then we also experienced that power of storytelling this morning with my new friend Nadumi. It's just incredible to be able to sit in space with such amazing folks. 
If you also ever, if you also sort of ever need to remind yourself of that power as well, you know, I encourage you to find the film Exonerated on YouTube and actually for once, like actually read through the comments. They're um, incredibly inspiring by people who, who have had their minds changed by simply listening to the stories of folks and, and felt um, the incredible power of what that experience and, and flaw of the death penalty is. So many of these, um, the key messages that we use for the campaign will be, you know, familiar to all of you, the experts. Um, but, you know, overall, we sort of ran with the death does not equal justice message. You know, we heard this morning that responses to crimes can be met with justice and not with vengeance. We also then used, um, we also then talked about four kind of key messages. The death penalty does not address the root cause of crime. Exonerees are living proof that the system is flawed. The death penalty is not fairly applied across the country, and the death penalty does not improve public safety. So again, I think all of these are quite familiar to me, to, to you all, but we took an incredibly pragmatic kind of talking points perspective to our campaign because we wanted, you know, of our thousands of folks that are on shop floors every day, we wanted them to be able to be really grounded in these sort of four facts that we know to be true about the problems with the death penalty. And we believe that our audience, you know, people that are buying soap and that are buying shampoo, but are, that are buying from us because they're buying from a company that they care about, that they would be open, um, but the company that they know that care about people in the planet, but that they would be opening to having their mindset changed by us. So briefly, um, these are the window boxes that we had in all of our shops. Um, and then we had sort of other signage that um, kind of highlighted those four key points that I talked about. And I think, you know, it hopefully is apparent that we weren't nuanced about our message in any way. Um, we had been encouraged to and did the work and felt very comfortable being quite explicit in terms of us calling for the abolition of the death penalty. Um, but, I, you know, I don't necessarily think that's an attack that all companies have to take. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But, you know, for us, it was just something that we were in a space and in a position to be able to do and had incredibly brave staff um, that were willing to do it. You know, one of our core competencies is that we sell cool stuff that goes in your bathtub. Uh, so, you know, we created a, a limited edition product, which um, then was sold uh, only that time during the campaign. And, you know, in some ways it's, uh, well, you know, it's, it's important because we want people to understand that by buying this, 100% of what they're paying, of, of what they're paying is going to go into a fund that supports organizations, but also just that exchange and that way that our staff folks could have conversations with customers. Um, is you know one of our kind of core competencies and we saw it as a really functional way to have the conversation. This is um, you know how it looked again in our stores. Um, but importantly, you know before we launched the campaign, all 8,500 of our staff were trained. Um, that was important to us because obviously we needed our staff on shop floors to really understand what they were talking about, to be able to address the tons and tons of questions that people would have. Um, but also because we wanted them to understand why we as the business supported abolition and effectively for them to become abolitionists themselves. So that was for all of the staff that are trained on the retail store, but we also did our support staff and our folks that are in manufacturing. So I'm you know, proud of what we did. I'm not here to say that what we did, um, you know, we did in any kind of way without the help and support of all the amazing organizations that helped us. But what we did, um, we really did in service to the larger movement with the hopes that the movement would be stronger um, when we sort of finished our campaign than it was from when we started. So these are um, a couple of the results. You know, we, through the sale of just that bath bomb, we raised $150,000 for nine organizations um, in addition to the folks that we had funded through our charity pop program. Many of you know Bill Pelkey, who is here um, from Journey of Hope, that just does incredible stuff, and we were, we were really proud to be able to support the work of the Journey in 2017. Um, and I know, you know that we changed hearts and minds. We have lots and lots of um, really amazing quotes from our staff, and again, those 8,500 people that we were just really able to touch and turn into abolitionists, let alone the millions of customers that we had through the doors. So the public response, um, you know, is overwhelmingly positive. It was definitely a tough issue that we knew that we were taking on. Um, and we were, um, 
you know, prepared in a lot of ways and solid in our stance and I think hopefully really provides an example for other businesses that you can do something. We were certainly nervous, you know, before we went up against the launch, but really once the campaign started and we saw so much um, positivity kind of flowing out, you can see in, in a couple of these media reports and from unlikely places, right? Like Teen Vogue is always going to cover when Lush puts out a new like purple bath bomb, but, you know, for them to just be so supportive of our stance on the death penalty. Um, so just to talk quickly about our um, our ongoing initiatives, we you know can, we have continued to fund the organizations through Charity Pot. Um, we also intervene on uh, intervene and collaborate on certain actions that we can. You know, for example, lawyers for William Morva reached out to us and asked that we write a letter to the governor of Virginia and support the clemency request for his scheduled execution. Um, we also took action recently with the. Um, with Governor Brown um, in California leaving office and the kind of request for him to commute all the sentences of inmates on death row in California. And the third thing I think I'm really excited about is our participation on the responsible business, with, the, with the Responsible Business Initiative on the death penalty. Um, founded fairly recently, the organization is, exists to advise and inform private businesses, trade leaders, and government entities who are concerned about the use of capital punishment in the United States, collaborating with leaders, innovators, and influencers to ensure trade and investment decisions are made with integrity. I think for us, it's um, being a business sort of based in North America, we provide a example that, you know, I hope for RBI is very useful to be able to go and talk to other businesses. But, you know, so much work can be done, as we've heard, you know, all throughout the morning and into this afternoon with businesses who can either draw the direct links, think that Maya was talking about, or the links, you know, on the basis of being a company made up of people that really care. I think those, you know, being able to have us as an example of that is something that I see as a real core part of our, um, our ongoing ability to continue to support the work towards abolition. So again, it's my hope that our example can shine a new light on how campaigning against the death penalty can take many, many forms in the U.S. The look and feel of the campaign was really designed by the grassroots organizations that we worked with, the folks who are leaders on the front lines in the field of abolition. You know, we really see the campaigning work that we did as just using our platform and what we had to get that message out. I think it's possible to bring other businesses along. I know that I continue to do that in the spaces in the U.S. that I work in. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody after this about how we can really further that work or some ideas or, you know, even us as the company, like some of those initial concerns that we had before really diving in. And then also Celia is here from the Responsible Business Initiative, and um, we've just worked together on kind of launching a toolkit, which is up on that website, which can be used as a guide for any of you who might be considering how you might want to bring businesses along on this, but using that guide to just get some ideas on what's possible. So I was going to end there. Um, again, looking forward to talk to anything, anybody throughout the rest of the week about how um, our example can be used. Um, but also, you know, feel free for anyone. I mean, that story really has to continue about how we worked on this campaign that was public facing for 10 days in 200 US stores, got a bunch of customers to really care about the issue, contribute some money and sign a petition uh, and, you know, change their mindset, change their hearts and change their minds. So really happy to share any of those learnings with you at all. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have a question for you before we move on to a couple of other business leaders. Uh, you've talked a bit about the US market, and of course, Lush is global. Um, can you speak to, and you may not work on it directly, but how you would envisage, if you think it's possible, a campaign in another country, because we've got representatives from all over the world here at the, at the World Congress. So what, what factors you'd be thinking about and how you would approach that, or if we've got people in the room who might want to approach you, what you would be looking to hear from them to help assist you in deciding if you could do a campaign in, in another country? Sure, yeah, happily. So we, um, initially when this idea had come up for us as the global part of Lush, the idea had been, let's do a global campaign calling for the abolition of the death penalty. And because we were the North American market, we felt that it was 
a little bit tricky or a little bit hard to be calling for global abolition if we were um, one of the offending countries. So then we built our campaign to um, specifically just talk about the United States. So I think for other folks, you know, figuring out which side the country that you are on is. Um, and if you are an abolitionist country, um, looking at what either those businesses are, I think there you know, is a ton of work that other folks are doing picking apart how you would decide what, um, what the angle would be for the particular company, or if it's a company that you know just has good human rights values, um, figuring out if there's a target in terms of looking at the, the top five countries, if there is you know, supporting some of the global mechanisms that exist, and really just as a country wanting to affirm the play, that country's stance on where you are. I think those are a couple of ideas. I also know, you know one of the core things that the Responsible Business Initiative wants to do is really get engaged with people who are interested in getting companies and in, getting companies involved. So I think that expertise, you know, definitely lies there. But certainly that idea of being able to say that this one company did it, why not another? That there's ways to talk about either having a direct connection or not have or just having that direction because you're a progressive, socially minded organization that cares about justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Emmanuel Oudar and Nadia Benida, who both run organizations that have done work on the death penalty. Emmanuel is the CEO of Tout Terrain, which is a company he founded in early 1991 to produce communication materials for events. He and his company have become active in anti-death penalty work in France, and Emmanuel is currently the deputy treasurer of the anti-death penalty organization Ensemble contre la peine de mort. Thank you, Emmanuel. Bonjour. Je dirige une petite entreprise dans le secteur de la communication événementielle, créée il y a plus de 25 ans, dont je suis le principal actionnaire. L'entreprise compte 12 salariés. C'est une entreprise qui fonctionne bien et qui produit des bénéfices. Pour une association qui sollicite du soutien auprès du secteur privé, il est préférable de choisir des entreprises qui portent bien pour obtenir de l'aide. L'entreprise est constituée d'une équipe de femmes et d'hommes compétents. Elle possède des outils de production, un lieu de stockage et des véhicules. Notre entreprise produit de la signalétique et des outils de communication du type banderole, panneau, drapeau, ballon et autres. Nous avons le rôle de conseil et une expertise pour fabriquer, pour optimiser la présence du sponsor sur le terrain de ces événements. Nous mettons en place ce matériel de communication sur des opérations de sponsoring, de marquage événementiel culturel, sportif, conférences de presse et autres. Au cours de l'année 2000, Suite à un appel au don de l'association Ensemble contre la peine de mort, trouvé dans la boîte aux lettres et qui m'a interpellé, je décide que l'entreprise peut faire un don à ECPM pour participer à l'abolition de la peine de mort dans le monde. Ce don, je l'ai renouvelé les années suivantes. Il m'est toujours paru évident que si deux personnes doivent établir des règles de vie communes, La première de ces règles, c'est de ne pas se donner le droit de vie ou de mort l'un sur l'autre. Lors de l'élection présidentielle de 1981 en France, mon vote en faveur de M. François Mitterrand a été essentiellement motivé par son engagement à abolir la peine de mort. C'est en 2004 que je suis contacté par le directeur de l'association Ensemble contre la peine de mort. Lors de notre rencontre, il m'est apparu évident que la participation de l'entreprise pouvait prendre d'autres formes. C'est également au même moment que je commence mon engagement personnel de militant pour agir contre la peine de mort. Je me souviens que dans les premières années de CPM, les besoins étaient aussi simples que de trouver un lieu où se réunir ou bien pouvoir photocopier des documents. C'est à l'époque un des membres de l'association, un avocat, qui nous accueillait dans son cabinet. C'est donc à partir de 2004 que notre entreprise accompagne et se met au service de CPM pour l'ensemble de ses besoins sur le terrain de ces événements. Je les conseille sur les matériaux, sur les différents types d'impression, sur le type de visuel, sur le graphisme. 
Nous fabriquons ces visuels, nous les installons sur le terrain, nous les récupérons et nous stockons ce matériel s'il est réutilisable. Les types d'événements auxquels nous avons participé sont par exemple chaque année le stand de la fête de l'humanité en septembre, la journée mondiale contre la peine de mort le 10 octobre, la marche des fiertés à Paris en juin, mais aussi lors de campagnes en faveur de condamnés à mort comme M. Hank Skinner ou M. Serge Atlaoui. Nous avons également fait des tirages pour des expositions de photos ou bien pour des expositions de dessins réalisées pour une des actions de CPM « Dessine-moi l'abolition » dans le cadre du projet « Éduquer à l'abolition ». Cette exposition est installée et visible lors de ce congrès. Et bien sûr, nous soutenons le septième congrès contre la peine de mort. J'ai provoqué des, des débats avec les salariés. J'ai pu sensibiliser des fournisseurs de l'entreprise et les faire participer à nos actions. Nous, entrepreneurs, nous pouvons, chacun à notre échelle, participer à l'abolition universelle de la peine de mort. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Nadia, Nadia Benhida is the CEO of a printing and communications business and a founding member of the Moroccan Prison Observatory, an uh, NGO in Morocco. She's used her position to speak out about the death penalty in Morocco as well as lending her business's support to anti-death penalty activities. And we'll hear a bit more about that now. Thank you. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je salue le Parlement européen, je salue l'association Ensemble contre la peine de mort, je salue les membres de sociétés civiles ici présents qui sont au cœur de cet événement. Madame, Monsieur, c'est un honneur de me tenir aujourd'hui devant vous pour témoigner d'une activité d'entrepreneurs en faveur de l'abolition de la peine de mort. Je suis chef d'entreprise, je suis membre fondatrice de l'Observatoire marocain des prisons. C'est cette organisation qui est à l'origine de la création de la coalition marocaine contre la peine de mort. Mon action en faveur de l'abolition est à la fois structurée et spontanée. C'est à la fois un engagement ferme et un travail d'artisanat. Je suis musulmane de culture et j'ai pour référence la Déclaration universelle des droits humains. Je participe et j'accompagne bien des fois l'organisation des événements organisés par les militantes les militants en faveur de l'abolition de la peine de mort. Je prends en charge parfois l'impression des documents, des dépliants, banderoles et autres, et autres supports de communication. Et je n'hésite pas à m'impliquer quand il s'agit d'un besoin logistique. Ces actions favorisent la visibilité d'une militance dont je dois dire ici la régularité et le dévouement. J'ai par ailleurs l'habitude d'accrocher sur les murs de mon entreprise certains supports de communication que je produis. Quand il s'agit de supports relatifs à l'action en faveur de l'abolition de la peine de mort, cela occasionne des échanges avec les visiteurs. De, mon, de manière spontanée, j'argumente contre la peine de mort dans l'exercice quotidien de mon métier. Je côtoie des milieux très divers. Les uns sont familiers des cultures politiques des droits de l'homme. D'autres sont hostiles à ces cultures parce qu'elles seraient importées d'Occident. Et d'autres indécis. Le plus difficile est de mobiliser toujours le même registre, celui des droits de l'homme, dans l'argumentation en faveur de l'abolition de la peine de mort. C'est pourquoi je répète certains arguments qui me semblent opératoires, quel que soit le milieu que je, que je fréquente et que je rappelle tout de suite. Je commence par... La peine de mort existe bien dans des pays, les uns autoritaires et d'autres pays, la, et d'autres sont démocratiques. La criminalité n'est pas pour autant absente dans ces pays-là. Donc, la peine de mort n'est pas dissuasive. 
La peine de mort fonctionne comme une punition collective. La famille de l'exécuté se vit comme un arbre amputé d'une branche. Les vivants se sentent stigmatisés à cause de leur relation avec l'exécuté. Ils sont désormais la famille du monstre qui est condamné à mort. Du coup, au lieu de favoriser une démarche responsable, lui c'est lui, moi c'est moi, et que chacun est responsable de ses actes, la condamnation à la peine de mort alimente une, responsable de, euh, alimente une conscience de nature communautaire. La pratique de la peine de mort nous enseigne plus sur les commanditaires que sur l'humanité du condamné. C'est parfois le désir de vengeance qui émerge à l'occasion d'une grande douleur. Ce désir est parfois profondément enfui chez nous humains et il fait surface à certaines occasions. Comme lors d'un fait divers, la mort d'une femme sous le coup de son compagnon en France. Je pense à l'affaire Marie très Trétignan. Ses proches et les amis de la famille ont souhaité la mort du, du coupable. Euh, la pratique de la peine de mort veut dire que nous sommes impuissants à éduquer, à changer, à reformer. Et c'est un choix un peu facile. L'abolition de la peine de mort nous humanise parce que nous attachons une grande valeur à la vie humaine, y compris celle d'un condamné. Je prends mes précautions en tant qu'entrepreneur et je n'aborde pas le sujet avec tout le monde. Cependant, chaque fois que l'occasion se présente, j'en profite pour sensibiliser à la barbarie de la peine de mort. Je me rends bien compte que souvent, les gens pris isolément sont réceptifs aux arguments que je viens d'énumérer. Le Code pénal marocain prévoit encore la condamnation à la peine capitale dont le cas de 11 crimes. Le chiffre 93 est le nombre de condamnés à mort au Maroc aujourd'hui. Si la Constitution adoptée en 2011 affirme le droit à la vie, il reste encore du chemin à parcourir avant l'abolition de la peine de mort. Je formule ici le vœu suivant. Nous ne pourrait-on pas imaginer un programme d'action, une sorte d'une durée limitée qui permettrait de populariser les arguments en faveur de l'abolition la, de, de la peine de mort Ne peut-on pas expérimenter auprès d'une partie de la, population, de la population une campagne dont on élargirait le bénéfice à l'ensemble de la population Je sais que le débat public peut radicaliser les positions. Je sais aussi qu'il est urgent, d'une certaine manière, d'enraciner partout les consciences dans les cultures politiques des droits humains. Il est cependant encore plus urgent de partager ce legs qui nous humanise tous en cette période de montée de popularisme, populisme, pardon, que les démocraties libérales prises en continu de promouvoir l'abolition de la peine de mort en tant que valeur fondamentale et en tant que marqueur d'une culture respectueuse de la dignité humaine. Je vois cependant l'engagement de l'entreprise dans la société l'oblige de défendre les valeurs humaines et en premier le droit à la vie. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci beaucoup. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, a question for you, Nadia, and then a question for both of you, Nadia and Emmanuel. First, why did you decide to engage your business on the issue of the death penalty? And then the second question for both of you is, or whoever wants to answer this, what has been the impact within the company? Has it changed things for your employees or your business model that you do take a position on this particular issue in a strategic and nuanced way? De mon côté, euh, l'engagement de l'entreprise euh, a suivi mon engagement. 
euh, tant que militante. Je l'avoue, j'ai fondé mon entreprise en 1996. Ça va faire, euh, elle va, faire, va fêter ses 23 ans le 20 mai prochain. Et euh, euh, je n'avais pas d'engagement civique. Et je me suis engagée, ça veut dire euh, en 1999, euh, dans la création de l'Observatoire marocain des prisons. Mm -hmm. Et en ce moment, j'ai commencé à sentir le, le, la nécessité que ça veut dire euh, quelqu'un tout seul ou euh, euh, une seule voix ne peut pas aboutir. Ça veut dire que je me suis retrouvée dans, dans le militantisme et l'engagement de l'association l'Observatoire marocain des prisons. C'était aussi un engagement pour moi et je suis membre de la coalition marocaine à travers mon association et je, par, par, par l'exercice de mon métier, que je sois imprimeur, que je suis appelé à participer, à anticiper, donc je me voyais vraiment très, euh, très inoffensif, très... Ça veut dire, il, il a fallu que je porte euh, une, valeur euh, une valeur ajoutée à, à l'association où je travaille en participant à, en participant à l'action ça veut dire une présence, ou avoir des idées, ou assister ou être membre, ce n'était pas suffisant pour moi, alors que je pouvais aider, que je pouvais donner un coup de main en imprimant ou en participant, en organisant. Et pour moi, ça, c'est au complet. On ne peut pas être un défendeur de droits humains dans une, dans une situation où là, la nuit, ou là, quand je dors, quand je me réveille, ça veut dire si on est des défendeurs de, droit, de droits humains, ça veut dire quand on se réveille, quand on dort, quand on part, quand on marche, et chez nous, à la maison, et quand on travaille. Et c'est un message qu'il faut passer. De ce qui est de la deuxième question, l'impact sur mon entreprise, je ne je, je me rappelle pas que j'ai eu euh, un client qui, qui a refusé de travailler avec Zinomar euh, parce que euh, Madame Nihida, le patron, est abolitionniste. Non, ça, j'ai jamais rencontré ça. Mais par contre, ça m'a donné une fenêtre, ça m'a donné euh, une occasion d'aborder le sujet à chaque fois que l'occasion se présente. Et je me réjouis parce que mes employés, ils croient maintenant. Ils croient à l'abolition. Et ils sont pour. Parce que, euh, comme on imprime plusieurs supports, ils ont eu l'occasion de voir des arguments des, des supporters. Et maintenant, ils sont en train de discuter, les, 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 les partisans et les, qui sont, ceux qui sont pour et ceux qui sont contre. Et je tiens à vous dire que Zinomar, c'est un nom qui est composé. Zino, c'est le prénom de mon fils, et Mar, c'est Maroc. C'est sur le... Donc j'ai deux choses qui me, qui me sont très chères, c'est mon fils et mon pays. Et je finis sur ça. Il y a un turnover très important. Mmh. Allô, allô. Merci. Euh, C'est une entreprise qui emploie des gens très jeunes, donc il y a un turnover euh, régulier. Et, euh, et du coup, ben, le débat est très régulier dans l'entreprise. Il est presque, presque permanent. Voilà. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn to Sunas Gadigard Torsen who is the CEO and founder of the consultancy Global CSR, based in Copenhagen. Following a career in international business and law, he specialized in corporate social responsibility uh, in 1996 and has since held a number of high-profile advisory positions in the sector, including for the Global Business Initiative on Human Rights. And he's also advised industry leaders from numerous sectors, ranging from the extractive industry to the pharmaceutical industry, fast-moving consumer goods uh, and fashion. His clients include state-owned enterprises, governments, development, corporation agencies, civil society organizations, and multilateral organizations such as the World Bank, UNDP, and the EU. He teaches corporate social responsibility at several universities, and his works have been published widely. And I have to say, he's also been, uh, he's worked with Reprieve on various matters and been a huge expert uh, and um, of assistance to us in civil society. Thank you, Suna. Well, thank you, Maya, for the very broad introduction. And uh, I did work in this field for 20 years, so that's why so, so many items could be on the CV. Thank you very much for inviting for this. It's a great privilege to be here today. I think the Congress uh, so far has shown its best face and a lot of interesting interventions. Also, it's 
a big privilege to be with so many human rights defenders in one room, and I really hope that I can contribute a little to thinking more strategically on how businesses can be part of this movement, but possibly also with the limitations that the international framework around business and human rights brings to the table. So I was actually called here to explain how corporate social responsibility relates to business and human rights, and thereby to the abolition of the death penalty. And uh, for that, I brought a few slides. I don't know if they will uh, appear at some point. But nevertheless, I worked 20 years to promote business and human rights. And of course, it's a great privilege to, today to see that the subject itself, business and human rights, is on the agenda of such an important Congress as your own. And fortunately, we do see business and human rights become a subject in mainstream human rights agendas from everything from forced labor, of course, which is evident of relevance to human rights defenders, to the abolition of the death penalty. Now, if we should define how corporate social responsibility and the corporate respect for human rights fit together, I try to give an illustration of the subject as such. In 2011, due to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the EU changed its definition on corporate social responsibility. And that's the definition that most corporations apply today. So a business corporate responsibility or corporate social responsibility is how businesses contribute, and that's voluntary what they do to contribute to sustainable development. And, and that's the non-voluntary part of corporate social responsibility as it is emerging, how do we manage our adverse impacts on the international principles for sustainable development. And what are these principles? They were already set out in 2000 with the UN Global Compact. So the core principles for social sustainability are, of course, human rights. The International Bill of Human Rights outlines the minimum standard for human dignity, and they form the key or the core of social sustainability. Then we have areas for environmental impacts and anti-corruption as the only subject for economic sustainability that we have agreed internationally. So business need, in order to proclaim themselves as responsible businesses, they need to manage all their potential and actual adverse impacts on human rights, on the environment, and in relation to the risk of ending up in corrupt practices, but it doesn't happen yet. In other words, corporate responsibility for human rights means that all businesses, all businesses in the world need regularly to calibrate what they're doing against human dignity. And in 2011, after 20 years of debate, the UN guiding principles were presented by Professor John Raghi, who, used, who spent six years on developing these for the UN. And the UN Human Rights Council unanimously endorsed the UN guiding principles. So we all agree, all states in the world agree that business should respect human rights. Now it's not any longer undefined what it means to respect human rights. It's well defined. It means that a business have to have a management system in place where they commit to respect human rights 
and the requirements for that commitment in the standard, they need continuously to assess i.e. identify their adverse impacts on human rights, what they do to prevent or mitigate those impacts, and they need to account for what they do to prevent uh, those impacts. That's the management system. Finally, if it goes wrong, and it does go wrong for businesses, they need to provide access to remedy through grievance mechanisms. So three elements that need to be in place for any business. The OECD took the guiding principles to heart and transferred them immediately to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and applied that management system to also environmental impacts and anti-corruption impacts, impacts that John Ruggie, who created the guiding principles, were not mandated to look at. So the bar has been set high. All businesses, no matter where they operate or what they do, shall regularly identify, prevent, or mitigate risks of adverse impacts on all the human rights from the International Bill of Human Rights. Also, the right to life, of course. Now, I work for investors as well. They just started to look at businesses and say, I can, I can only invest in your business if you respect human rights. So what I have to do is I have to go in and look at the business. Do you have this policy commitment in place that is publicly available that lead, meet the criteria? Do you run your regular due diligence? Can you please show me your impact assessment so that you can verify to me that you run your due diligence? and do you provide access to remedy through grievance mechanisms, show me what you are doing here. So it's important for the agenda going forward that one realizes that states have to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. Businesses shall respect human rights, but it's a different respect than the kind defined for states. John Ruggie used a whole report to explain that difference. So any business have human rights impacts, adverse impacts, no matter where they operate, they need to manage them and they need to be communicate, be transparent about how they do it. It's not happening yet. It's slowly in progress. France has passed legislation to that end. The Netherlands have passed legislation from 2020. And we've seen Germany and now uh, Switzerland also considering to pass the obligation to respect human rights. Now, should business then get involved in the work of the abolition of the death penalty? Well, what shall business do? What is the obligation of business under this new standard? The ob obligation is that if a business cause contribute or linked to an incidence of the death penalty, they shall act. They have to act. And they have to communicate what they do to prevent or mitigate the severe impact that the execution of a prisoner constitutes. Per definition, in the guiding principles, the death and adverse impact on the right to life is irremediable, that's the wording the guiding principles use, so it's per definition severe. So the business on top of this have to officially communicate what they're doing to prevent or mitigate this from happening. And it's exactly that wording we used in the collaboration with Reprieve, when Reprieve asked Lundbeck, the Danish pharmaceutical company that supplied drugs to the, uh, to the death row in the U.S. to stop that distribution of the drugs. And suddenly, this was in 2011, the guiding principles were just passed, so it was the first application of the U.N. guiding principles vis-a-vis -vis a company, but the company was equally happy that now they knew exactly how they should deal with this challenge because it has been well-defined with the guiding 
principles. So only if you are somehow linked to the execution you have and a responsibility to act upon this. Now we've seen today three companies that have voluntarily jumped into this space in order to promote from moral reasons, as Richard Branson also stated, that they want to engage themselves and their companies in the discourse of the abolition of human rights. And uh, anecdotally, that's why I entered into the space of business and human rights. So I was a corporate lawyer. I was working with setting up telecom companies in Russia and St. Petersburg. And I decided, hmm, corporate resp social responsibility is on the agenda, but human rights is absent from that agenda. How, do we, how can we change that? How can human dignity become the core of corporate social responsibility? And I shifted into working with corporate responsibility from then, trying to push human rights into the agenda. Also, I found out that business or state-to-state -state relations on human rights carry uh, or have a lot of limitations. The receiving state on criticism will not, will not be very, very likely to change uh, uh, very fast. It's only political pr pressure and we are not very fond of being subjected to that. Also, civil society to state brings only very slow change, and we should appreciate that, which is a, it's a good idea to take business on board. So the idea with the whole project of business and human rights is, of course, that business have an interest in how the state deals with its human rights obligations. If the state mess up its human rights obligations, it becomes an expense for business. In Denmark, the state perpetrates widespread discrimination. Now, that is a risk for any business in Denmark to make sure that they do not become part of discrimination. They have a responsibility to prevent or mitigate any case of discrimination based on all discrimination grounds. And they even more so have that responsibility because we know that discrimination, structural discrimination, is widespread in the society. So whatever the state misses to do, the governments will have an interest to speak to states and make them change their policies towards improving the human rights situation so that it doesn't become an expense for the business running its business there. And that's what investors have discovered. So there's a very, very close relationship between having death penalty as part of your legal system and the degree of risk, political risks, we see for investing in that state or in companies in that state. So when I work with investors, of course they start to rank the states that they are looking for investments in. And one of the indicators will be does that state have death, the death penalty, then it's most likely a more risky investment than within the government that has abolished the death penalty. So with that, I hope that you get a little interest in working with business and human rights, but there are definitely some challenges, and I would recommend you very much to get be very clear on what, what shall businesses do in contrary to what can businesses do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to throw out two hypotheticals. You can pick one or the other or both. Um, I'm thinking about situations where we have businesses that may be argued to have been involved in the death penalty directly or indirectly. And I'd like to know how you, as an expert in CSR and business and human rights, would approach these businesses. So one scenario one might envisage is uh, in a country where 
people are being sentenced to death and executed for political offenses um, and perhaps for protest, peaceful protest offenses. And the state in question is saying that the evidence is based on their social media output. So perhaps they've tweeted about it and that's a given offence, or perhaps they've posted a picture of a gathering and that's been used as evidence to sentence somebody to death in, a, in one of these countries. Um, my question there would be, what would be your approach? Do you think the tech companies under the framework would have a responsibility towards those individuals who are facing the death penalty? Um, and if so, how would you approach them? Another hypothetical, and just to put two out, because they may be relevant to people in the room, um, we know that migrant workers travel from, for example, South Asian countries to uh, the Gulf states uh, and the Middle East, and many of them, some of them, end up being uh, accused of transporting drugs and um, in some countries sentenced to death and executed. And what has emerged is a pattern of trafficking whereby vulnerable migrant workers are coerced into carrying drugs or accused wrongly of having had drugs and sentenced to death and executed. Often they've gone over subject to tenders with, for example, construction companies. So in that circumstance where you have individuals, vulnerable individuals who've been sent over to another country and to work for a particular company and then they've suffered serious human rights abuses, what would your approach be towards those companies? Do they have a duty to protect in some way or to advocate against the use of the death penalty? And if so, how would you approach it? And they don't have a duty to protect. That's the state's duty. But they have a responsibility to respect human rights. And the responsibility to respect human rights constitutes of a requirement for action once you find out that you are linked, even if you are merely linked to an adverse impact on human rights. And it's obvious in both instances, both the social media uh, instances and the, the, the company that is here linked to a recruitment company that somehow, or they themselves, make uh, uh, the, the guest workers uh, being now drug uh, transporters, that they have the responsibility to use their leverage or build their leverage to make that practice stop and not reoccur, i.e. make the recruitment firm respect human rights. So the different the definitions are quite clear, and they have raised the bar considerably in terms of what businesses shall do. And the, the beauty about it is that we can all hold them accountable to this. And they cannot deny that they should not do this. They will deny it because they will not know the UN guiding principles yet. It's a, basically it's a very new instrument. Uh, very few companies can today document that they respect human rights. So, but it's emerging when states follow their obligations under the UN guiding principles to regulate businesses within their territories to respect human rights. But yes, they have a responsibility under the guiding principles to act. If they don't, they don't respect human rights. No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last presentation is from Cecilia Malmström, and I think that should be on the screen. She has served as European Commissioner for Trade since 2014, and prior to that was European Commissioner for Home Affairs and Minister for European Union Affairs. She was also an MEP, representing Sweden from 1999 to 2006. And during her time as European Commissioner for Trade, Cecilia Malmström launched the Global Alliance for Torture-Free Trade, an initiative of Argentina, the EU, and Mongolia, which aims to end the global trade in goods used to carry out the death penalty and torture. And we have a representative here, Miguel Ceballos, who can answer questions after her presentation, uh, should we have any. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Capital punishment is the epitome of cruelty and inhumanity. Every day, people are executed and sentenced to death. They die by hanging, shooting, beheading, stoning, electrocution, lethal injection, or 
the gas chamber. Some committed terrible crimes, and others die for things that should not even be illegal in the first place. Some are adults with families and children, and some are not even 18 years old when they were sentenced. In the 21st century, you can be executed for political protests, accusations of adultery, or your sexuality. This is what the death penalty looks like in 2019. It is unjustifiable, a relic of a darker part of humanity. When we seek to make a change in the world, we cannot change everything at once. Instead, we make many small impacts in many places, and that's how real change happens. The death penalty is against our fundamental values as Europeans. When it comes to fighting it, trade policy must do its part too. The death penalty does not just happen, it has to be facilitated. Chemicals, equipments and other materials must be used. So banning these instruments will not bring an end to the death penalty, but it will make the executor's life more difficult. In the EU, we have already banned the sale and export of these goods since 2005. And despite growing international cooperation, the tools used to execute people are traded across the globe like any other commodity. Global challenges need global solutions. The EU can no longer operate alone. A coordinated international effort is required. And that is why the EU, together with Argentina and Mongolia, launched in 2017 a global alliance to end trade in products used for torture and capital punishment. And in September last year, more than 60 countries in the Alliance agreed to prepare the work for concluding an international instrument, negotiated on a non-discriminatory, transparent and multilateral basis to establish common international standards for the import, export and transfer of goods used for capital punishment, torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. A society that tolerates the death penalty cannot claim to respect human rights. It is our duty to end this terrible practice, not just as Europeans, but as human beings. I wish you a successful conference. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Cecilia Malmström. Um, we didn't have, we don't have today, Githu Mwigai, who is a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Uh, so I'm going to ask Suna, who has worked with the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, to tell us just a little bit about what that group is looking at at the moment um, and anything else you think that uh, our audience should know. So the, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights is the instrument that the UN put in place following the special representative of the Secretary General, John Rogge, after his mandate ended. In addition to the working group, we have an annual forum for business and human rights, and I can strongly recommend you to go there every year. In November, 3,500 to 4,000 people gather to take stock of how far are we globally in implementing the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. And uh, of course, as a practitioner and having advised businesses and being able to provide the practical evidence on how to implement the UN guiding principles, uh, I'm in, in often in contact with the UN working group and work together on trying to define where, where do we need to go from here. And last year, fortunately, the UN Working Group focused most of the year on how can we move forward on human rights due diligence. How can we make businesses show that they actually respect human rights, i.e. run these regular human rights impact assessments in all their operations. Now, uh, much to the... Uh, uh, of course, the UN Working Group was, was disappointed to find that we have moved not very far yet uh, since 2011, but that some better practices are emerging. Then on top of that, the UN Working Group have put focus on the gender mainstreaming in human rights. So the gender aspect has become a specific focus point for the UN Working Group under the broader human rights agenda for 2019. And they also have quite a strong focus on human rights defenders. 
So we have seen the international community and many businesses also now moving into the space of how do we improve the protection of human rights defenders where such people are under pressure. I mean, it's, it's quite a... Uh, I mean, I can sit here, I'm coming from Denmark, I would never be subjected to risk for my life even though uh, I do argue with the Danish government from time to time. But, <clears throat> but many of you are not in that situation when you raise the voice on human rights. So how, how can we make sure that business start putting pressure in order to protect human rights defenders? And I think that, that avenue and that focus, the abolitionist discourse can easily, so say, move in and, and have some collaboration with. Finally, they are looking very much on investor relations. So they know from the UN Working Group that if we get the investors on board, and at first, in the first four to five years, investors drew back. They thought they were not bound by the UN guiding principles because they were such special breed that they were not considered businesses. But then they were told by the Honorable a human rights commissioner that they are indeed also supposed to respect human rights and make sure that hum human rights are respected in all their business relationships, i.e. with all the investments. So can investors, can the abolitionist movement start to work with investors? That, that could create some very, very uh, interesting uh, uh, dynamics and that is, will also be an avenue into working more with the UN Working Group. I'm sure that the UN Working Group will welcome uh, uh, the dialogues and, and the opportunities that could, could come out of working together by uh, ensuring that no state will ever again kill their citizens. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now... I'm now going to open up to the floor for a few questions. Uh, so, if you'd like to start, and sorry, I should say, um, will you please stand up and press the button on your microphone, um, and then we will have, yeah. Thank you. My name is Michael Elman from London. I'm one of the directors of the Guyana Justice Institute. That's Guyana in South America, formerly British Guyana, next to Suriname and Guyane Francaise. And we have a big campaign in Guyana to abolish the death penalty. It's the only country in South America which still has the death penalty and exercises it. But not only that, we're also planning a Caribbean-wide conference against the death penalty, which we hope to take place in September or October this year. We've got the support of Bianca Jagger and a number of other um, activists in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Um, uh, the only thing that we're short of is finance to fund the, uh, the Congress. Um, so I'd be very glad of any suggestions to help us this w in this way. And if anyone is from that part of the world, from the Caribbean, I would be very glad to hear from them and we can work together. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you very much. I have another question over here. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Hamid Tahirzadeh, I'm from Iran. Actually, it's now 40 years that I have been deprived of going to my country because of this so-called Islamic fundamentalist regime in power. I'm so grateful to all the speakers who raise very important issues of human rights, especially Mr. Thorson, you mentioned about human rights and business. May I tell you that for the Iranians, the business and trade and so on means blood money, unfortunately. How is it so? The problem is, over the past 40 years, many European countries, because of their vested interest in Iran, because Iran is a very, very rich country, we have a lot of petroleum, 
So they have turned a blind eye upon all these human rights violations. Can you imagine when every time there is a delegation going from European Union or other countries, when they go to Iran, on the eve of their arrival, there is public hangings. And unfortunately, these delegations, they never mention anything whatsoever about these atrocities taking place. I may show you this book, which contains the names and particulars of more than 2,000, 20,000 of the innocent political prisoners who have been executed by this regime. Why, for so many years, there is no question of that. In 1988, 30,000 political prisoners were executed. And now Amnesty International yesterday, in a message to the Council of Human Rights, they ask actually UN and also everyone to take drastic action against this. 65 central resolutions have been adopted by different bodies of United Nations against gross human rights violations. But it has never done anything concrete in order to stop this. We need really international community to raise this issue and the matter should be taken to the Security Council. It's very important to stop because Iran is not just a matter of atomic bomb or this sort of deals with the European, they say. Can I say, tell you this? The Iranians say, do you think that the human rights of the Iranian people is different from human rights of the Europeans? Why is it so? Why is it so that you should, for so many years, neglect this? This is the rep your own report. Iran okay. is number two, or I should Thank say number you. one, in terms of the total executions against China. Sir, is, it's a really so that important is why point you're making. Please do take certain very drastic and concrete action to I stop think, this barbarism. I and now there is a diplomat, Iranian diplomat, who is in prison because they wanted to bomb a gathering of the thousands of the Iranian in Paris. And I told this afternoon to the foreign minister of Belgium. So this is, this is important. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank your time. Thank you. Thank you. And I think just the... I think that's an important point there, which is for those people who are working actively on death penalty matters in Iran, and we know that there are a large number of executions in Iran, as we've heard, uh, for all manner of crime, that perhaps looking at the uh, business links and seeing whether there may be companies that could be active in this space would be a helpful uh, route in. So I had a question in the middle there. I'm seeing more questions. So please, if I can ask you to keep your questions relatively short, make sure you stand up, say who you are, uh, and then I will aim to get through as many people as possible. Thank you. Name is Charles Hector. Now, I understand that the private sector has problems in terms of actually death penalty because primarily their interest is business. So the thing is, you know, in a sense of banning uh, uh, the sending of uh, equipment that actually facilitate execution, yes, that is one thing that can be done. But the other thing that I'm wondering that whether the private sector would be able to do was actually to speak up on uh, different issues. Because now in terms of one of the ways that civil society campaigns is by coming together. But this could, should be an in incentive by the private sector to form a sort of private sectors against uh, companies against death penalty and actually also speak up on different issues. Mm. Is that a problem with your shareholders or do you see it as a problem with this thing? Because it's your personal stand, maybe one thing, but when it comes to the company, it really belongs to the shareholders, no? Would that be a possibility? And the second question is that in terms of the states, when it comes to trade agreements, one of their concern is the industry players. So in, because of that, they are not going to be actually even in terms of uh, including terms with regards to, you know, if you're actually practicing death penalty, there will be certain uh, sanctions or certain no preferences or things like that, no? And in that sense, again, the business community ha can, has a role to play to help states be able to make more positive uh, positions. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to... Uh 
pass, I'm going to split that question, those two questions into two, and uh, hand one over to uh, Lash, uh, Kaleen, our representative there, and the other side of it. So the, the first question, I think, is about whether there are issues for shareholders since businesses are governed by shareholders, many of them that are publicly listed, and how the shareholders feel about this. Could it be a positive for shareholders that a company takes action on the death penalty? And then uh, I think if the second question was uh, to do with... Um, Suno, perhaps you can speak to the way in which the death penalty might be viewed as an indicator for companies looking to do business and, and, and whether, therefore, in states where they have the death penalty, it might be seen as a deterrent to investment in some way. Uh, thank you for your question. The, uh, uh, talking about Lush and specifically like Lush North America were privately held, so in terms of speaking exactly to the shareholder question, um, it's you know, I can tell you that the will, um, you know, that the will exists in our leadership and, and from our president to um, to work on issues that we think are important to us as the business. So how, if we were in a public situation that would trickle down to shareholders would be unclear. Um, I know that with the, as we were putting our campaign together, we had a very sort of twofold strategy. One was to and I think this is what you were initially sort of speaking to or asking about, was that we did want to garner support. Um, we did want to garner public support, the individuals, you know, so people were actually encouraged to take action in the shops, not only by, you know, contributing to that fund of money that, um, that we were that we were able to create, but secondly, to be adding their name to a petition, which then became part of a mobilizing tool for the organization we were working with. So, you know, while we were maybe openly or publicly engaged in the issue for that 10 day period, sort of out in public, that those folks who had added their name could continue to engage on all the issues that the organization we worked with um, wanted them to be a part of and, and stay up to date with what was happening, whether it was at a state level in the US or a national level. Um, but then secondarily, to be very clear that we as the business were taking that stand. I would say, um, amongst friends, um, you know, that, that similarly that question of, you know, was it, is it gonna harm the business or is it going to be something that we would then, um, you know, that the business would kind of quote unquote benefit from, that that is, uh, that's not so much the, the way that we approach taking this, taking a stand on any of the issues that we do. It, it kind of comes from that. We often say, and, and all of us have heard this, but we often sort of say the right side of history approach. You know, when you look 15, 25, or 100 years down the road, like, will we be proud of the position that we took and, for that, when we really dug into the death penalty, became such a, no, a no-brainer. Um, we felt also very confident in the partnerships that we had, and of course, again, all of this comes back to the work that all of you do, but you know, very clear that we had the answers um, to so many of the questions that any dissenters would have. And the last thing I would say on that is that what we did experience as the business, though, is certainly, um, a lot of questions, a lot of <laughs> ranging from questions to very negative, you know, to sort of a, a degree of negativity that we did see coming from the public, how you would want to gauge that because it was primarily through social media, so how much importance anybody wants to give that is kind of up to how much you believe um, in who the people are that are writing negative comments. But I know that we now firmly would stand behind our position that as us as the business, we sort of gained more people. Um, I think, I know that we were, we're now in spaces sort of as a allied company, but also allied individuals in places that we weren't before. And that that um, vastly outweighs the people who maybe took a position to say that well, I'm never gonna come into your store again. So I do think that the kind of quote unquote business argument is there. Um, and it's certainly an interesting thing to talk more about, which I'd be happy to. Wonderful, thank you. And did you want to speak to the second part? A few, a few comments. Uh, the abolition of the death penalty does not lie very close to any business uh, in terms of how to 
strategically contribute to the fulfillment of different human rights. So it's, it's far from companies when they make their strategies on how they want to make a difference on social sustainability to fetch the idea that we should work on the abolition of the death penalty. Those few companies that are involved in those adverse impacts, those abuses, they would not like to promote their engagement because they are involved, so they would rather hush the subject, which is probably why we don't have any pharmaceutical businesses in the panel today. Now, for you it will be a difficult case, but you can use Lush and you can use Richard Branson that for more courses took it upon themselves to promote this issue, and you can possibly get more businesses on board that can see a strategic value in this. I would definitely look at the B2C segment, business to consumer, rather than the B2B segment, which would have no interest whatsoever in speaking to this subject, mm -hmm. or promoting that subject, branding themselves upon the fact that they contribute. Mm -hmm. for, for the other issue, please, please note that this is extremely nascent. The baby has just been born. It's, we have very, very few companies that respect human rights, but all states are obligated to regulate business to respect human rights, and all businesses know that they will have to respect human rights. Now, the advantages of this is that business have access to government leaders, also in Iran. Iran will not be able to create a sustainable society if it's not based on market economy. So we know that businesses have the access. Now businesses, all businesses in the world, shall respect human rights. It means that they have to inform themselves on human rights. So we are creating an environment where business leaders become informed. The board of directors will discuss human rights. The executives will discuss human rights. So it would be more relevant and more natural for them to bring that subject on the table. For me personally, it has become much easier than working for the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a consultant or whatever, to work in the business and human rights area when, when going to China and meeting people from the Politburo to, to enter the door speaking about business and human rights. This is a subject which is arm's length from what the state does. But nevertheless, it's it's a must also for the Chinese government to have those discussions because they also committed to implement the UN guiding principles and they're now looking at how they can make state-owned enterprises respect human rights. So it is definitely a way in to get the communication, but it's not a very confrontational, rather a constructive campaigning approach that uh, one can use, uh, and that I think the Apollonist movement can also use. Great. Thank you. Another question. Yeah. Would you stand up as well? Thank you. Uh, so, so is good. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, we come here because uh, we have a big problem. The Egypt extension, 15 person the last week and the European Union leader being after that, after one week to the Egypt. Why we come here today, why the European leader not stop support all the dictator in the Middle East? I don't know why the old leader go from European Union after one week directly to Egypt. We must support the human rights in Egypt. We have a lot of Egyptian people now. They get a problem. We have 60,000 Egyptian people. A lot of people coming every day out this regime. How we can stop that from European Union and how we can support that from international community. Thank you. Thank you. And just behind you, there's another question. Thank you very much. My name is Alice Mokwe. I'm from um, an organization, the Twana of the Botswana Center for Human Rights, and also representing FIDH. Um, I'd just like to say merci beaucoup to Madame Nadia Benhida 
Um, I had a question relating to a comment you made. You described yourself as a Muslim, or somebody having a Muslim culture and religion, but having your reference point as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I was just interested um, to ask you to share with us how you managed to engage your cultural space in Morocco um, and your community where the Universal Declaration for Human Rights is not necessarily the basis um, of the community's discussion about human rights and the death penalty. Thank you. Nadia. Je j'ai dit sur ma mon intervention que je suis musulmane de culture, mais j'ai comme référence la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme. Ça veut dire que moi, pour pour convaincre, pour m'argumenter et pour soutenir l'abolition de la peine de mort, je passe par la Déclaration universelle et je ne peux pas passer du côté musulman parce que je ne suis pas formée pour débattre ce sujet. Donc je choisis toujours comme référence la déclaration parce que c'est une euh, la déclaration c'est une euh, c'est une référence euh, qui est universelle, c'est une référence qui euh, que le droit à la vie prime sur tous les, les, les articles et c'est l'article 3 et je défends le droit à la vie parce parce que je défendre le droit euh, défendre l'abolition à travers des cultures et sur euh, sur le, la déclaration des droits de l'homme toutes les religions et sont égaux euh, on est très tolérant et on accepte tout le monde donc euh, et comme je, je reviens et je vous dis que je, je ne peux pas rentrer dans tout ce qui est euh, euh, religieux je ne suis pas formé et je ne suis pas je ne suis pas de, de je ne suis pas apte je, je, ne, je ne peux pas merci Thank you. So we have a few questions. I'm just going to take a few at once now. So there's one over here, and there's a man here who's been waiting for some time, and then there, and over to ECPM. And uh, if you could, if you've got specific questions to specific members of the panel, please do say so. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mohamed Rajai Barakat. Uh, je suis un citoyen européen d'origine du Moyen-Orient, et comme mon nom l'indique. Uh, je suis de culture et de religion musulmane. Vous savez, il y a 1,2 milliard de personnes dans le monde qui sont musulmans. Et il y en a beaucoup qui croient au Coran, qui croient encore au Coran. Et dans le Coran, chose qui n'a pas été expliquée aujourd'hui, il y a euh, la, la peine de mort, la peine capitale. Mais c'est sous condition... Je m'étonne de ne pas voir parmi les pénalistes, le matin et cet après-midi, y compris aussi pendant les différentes euh, séances de travail, demain et après-demain, d'inviter des gens qui expliquent la position de cette religion vis-à-vis -vis de la peine de mort. Nous sommes en train, ce n'est pas nécessairement mon avis, hein, mais nous sommes en train de débattre des choses, et y compris madame, elle l'a dit elle-même maintenant, qu'elle ne sait pas parler de cette Question. Vous parlez du secteur privé dans les pays arabes et dans, enfin, dans le monde et sa position vis-à-vis -vis de la peine capitale. Malheureusement, dans les pays de tiers-monde, le secteur privé, y compris les multinationales, sont en train de commettre des choses qui sont, à mon sens, plus horribles encore que la peine capitale ou le nombre des gens qui sont assassinés dans les pays musulmans par la peine capitale. Et le collègue là-bas a parlé de la conférence de sommet euh, euro-arabe qui a eu lieu il y a trois jours à charles euh, on a parlé, Ils ont parlé de respect des valeurs mutuelles, mais je vois qu'il y a un manque de communication. Ce matin, là-bas, il y avait beaucoup d'ambassadeurs arabes, musulmans, et quand je sentais quand il y avait des applaudissements, les applaudissements étaient très bas. Tout le monde n'était pas d'accord. Comment vous voulez débattre avec les pays qui ne sont pas contre la peine capitale ouais. si vous ne les invitez pas d'égal ouais. 
okay. dans vos conférences. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Uh, I'm just going to say I will pass on to the next question, but I will say we have a panel on religious leaders uh, who are discussing the death penalty from different religious perspectives that is taking place on Friday. Uh, and there's an imam there who supports the movement, uh, the abolitionist movement in Niger. So I hope you will attend that, and that might also provide a, a fruitful forum to have this discussion. Um, I know there was ECPM here with a question, and just and over there as well. So um, Sandrine from ECPM. Um, my question is slightly political. I think you raised the issue of uh, fair trade standards. Um, I have been very puzzled with the position of the European Union, which is really vocal in favor of the abolition of the death penalty, and while at the same time uh, granting trade agreements to killer states. Uh, why isn't it possible to integrate human rights criteria in trade agreement application, not to make them exclude applicants, but at least to be taken into consideration? Because we can't, you know, feed the abolitionist movement with money on one hand and feed the beast on the other. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. And I'll just take another, the other question from over there, the gentleman who's been waiting very patiently. Please, would you stand up also? Good evening, and thank you for your presentation. I am from Liberia. I'm a commissioner of human rights. Uh, I have this concern. For many years now, the focus of the death penalty is addressing the penal codes that prescribe the death penalty. Uh, I'm not hearing more dial. I'm not getting more dialogue about the excessive use of force that is leading many people to, their, to, to, to die and the military, the paramilitary use excessive force that many people get killed every year, every day. And is that time now that we begin to think about the excessive use of force around the world? Mm. So may I just check, is your question, in, in relation to the businesses, are you asking whether they might have yes. uh, it, some yeah. Is the business community now more engage? concerned about where they are investing, I see. if the military or the I paramilitary see. are using excessive force. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I think with both of those questions, we're looking at um, well, trade and, and business. Maybe Miguel, if you want to talk, speak to the trade question, maybe with a mention of GSP Plus as well as the Alliance, uh, and then whoever wants to speak to, to, to investment in countries where there are excessive. I think it is, it's a really good point that um, the commissioner makes on countries where there are lots of other potential human rights abuses that relate to the use of lethal force outside of the death penalty context as well. And I'd be interested to hear from our panelists whether they think that businesses would be um, slightly shy away from investing in such countries, and if so, for what reasons. Thank you, Maya. Indeed, the European Commission has been moving in recent years from a trade agenda that was more based on a mercantilistic approach, based on the economic benefits, trade, trade, purely trade relations. In recent years, we've been moving into a more values-based agenda, trade agenda. And in the last four years, under the Juncker Commission, with our Commissioner Malmström, we've been integrating precisely the respect of human rights as a top priority in our trade agenda. And we do it in, uh, through three main instruments. First, on what we call the unilateral trade preferences. This is, in particular, the general system of preference. That is an incentive for developing countries to export into the European Union, which is the lar largest market in the world. But this is not a trade preference given with no conditions. There are conditions, and on the, on the first and most important condition is the respect of human rights. In case of massive violations of human rights, we may suspend these trade preferences. And this is a sanction, somehow, to the country, but more important, this is a message to, to business. Which, is, which are discussing today. So I'll give you the example of what's happened recently in one of the countries that benefits from our trade preferences, Cambodia, Myanmar. They have increased their exports to the EU thanks to this preferential trade regime. 
uh, we have just opened a procedure to eventually suspend these trade preferences in Cambodia because of the violation of human rights in general. And after the reports by the United Nations on the uh, genocide and the uh, extrajudiciary killings in Myanmar, we have already sent a warning to the government in Myanmar that we want the situation be addressed and improved quickly. Otherwise, we could also start the procedure against uh, the, towards the suspension of uh, trade preferences there. And you know what happens is, of course, the government engages and is ready to, to discuss with us and improve the situation. It's interesting how business immediately come to see us and say, what's going on? I don't want to do business. I don't want to manufacture in that country that is going to be listed as a violator of human rights. It has a strong, strong pressure on the country because very often I'm talking about the European companies based on those countries. They create jobs, they, create, they pay taxes, this is good for the country, and they have direct access to the government. So they really can make a difference. So when people here were talking about giving incentives to business, well, we give an incentive to the good countries that have a good protection of human rights to export and trade with the European Union in preferential, in better conditions, export more. Attracting investment, from European companies. The moment these, company, these countries do not behave and violate human rights, we send a warning. They may lose the preferences. And the impact is not only the, uh, the lost advantage on trade, it's the message sent to business and the pressure that business locally apply into, into, into the governments. And the other initiative that I mentioned, the commissioner mentioned in the, uh, in the speech, in the, uh, through the video recording, is that now, in con concretely on this penalty, we are trying to expand the EU legislation on trade control for products used in capital punishment and torture, including drugs used for lethal injections. This is a legislation that exists in the EU since 2005. Now we are trying to extend this approach globally. So by the time we're speaking, uh, diplomats in New York are discussing in the United Nations how to prepare the ground for a negotiation that may end in a legally binding instrument that would ban the trade on these products for torture, to stop exporting and manufacturing uh, electric chairs, gas chambers, uh, and, uh, and drugs that are only used for lethal injections. Thank you. I think that, that answer probably covered uh, two questions. So we have very little time left. I'm going to take uh, maybe two more questions from the floor, and then we're just going to have to wrap up. So please make your questions very, very quick. Over here. Uh, I, uh, I am a Bosnian citizen, and uh, uh, in the relationship between the uh, economic and the death penalty, which I think this is a subject of this uh, session, uh, I'm wondering, uh, as my colleague have mentioned, that uh, uh, 52 persons have been uh, sentenced to, to death penalty in Egypt by the uh, regime who is a product of uh, coup, and uh, the relationship between the European Union and uh, that regime is uh, every day uh, stronger and stronger. And uh, I would like to, to address this uh, 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 question for anybody who is represent the European Union. I could understand that uh, uh, a president of France, uh, Mr. Macron or Mrs. Merkel, she, uh, she would like to, to, to make some business uh, through uh, buying or selling some uh, weapons or something for these regimes. But I don't, I don't uh, understand, I can't understand that the European Union with all its institution after, after just only three or four days of sentencing sentin, uh, 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 nine uh, uh, youth people, their average uh, 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 age around 25 to, 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 to be uh, uh, killed by this regime and all the European Union institution be a guest in, in, in Egypt. Thank you. I'm actually going to 
I'm going to say there are lots of uh, representatives in the Congress, fortunately, who you can discuss that with. But because this is on business, I'm going to move on to, and I'm going to ask if somebody has a question about business and human rights. And this is the last question. So There are lots of questions, but I'll come to you right after. Then it's the very last one, and I know the interpreters need to go, and they've done an amazing job. So please go ahead, um, and then we'll do one more, and then we'll close. I was just wondering whether you see whether there's any hope in incorporating uh, the death penalty in the national action plans for business and human rights. And the last question from you, sir. My question is very short. Mm -hmm. je, je me demande comment peut-on encourager les entreprises, les moyennes et petites, mm -hmm. de s'investir dans le domaine des droits des humains et euh, dans le combat contre la peine de mort, où la transparence ne règne pas. Est-ce que le combat pour les droits humains en général, pour la peine de mort, euh, peut être euh, euh, indépendant du combat de, contre la... la, 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 la la corruption, mm. parce que la corruption, euh, ben, c'est un fléau qui, qui, qui menace les entreprises de se développer économiquement, industriellement et commercialement, et certainement, ce serait un entrave pour que ces institutions ces, soient impliquées directement dans un combat qui est de nature politique et droits humains. Merci. OK. Thank you very much for excellent last questions. Uh, the first question, perhaps Suna might take, and Nadia for the second question, and Emmanuel, if you have more time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Very, very good question. Can uh, the national action plans on implementing the UN guiding principles that states are expected to develop, can they include uh, the death penalty? And uh, since it's the national human rights institutions in the different countries that are normally charged with draw drafting uh, this uh, national action plan, I see no reason why not to implement also something, but I would frame it around investment climate, as we uh, have discussed lengthy today, because it's one of many indicators. Another would be the corruption index. What does the transparency uh, uh, perception index say about the status of that country? A third indicator would be whether there would be unrest in the company and, uh, or in, in, in the state. Uh, and I've seen many investors draw back from uh, uh, investments in countries where you would see uh, civil unrest and where you see militia operating or you would see a need to, to have a huge cost engaging with security forces in order to protect your interest. So of course all these elements, indicators put together create a picture of a state that does not care about human rights and therefore it's, it's a good idea to address it in a national action plan on implementing the UN guiding principles in any state. Thank you. And Nadia? Oui, sur le sur l'autre moitié de, de la question posée par Medjamey, comment les moyennes et petites entreprises peuvent être membres aussi et peuvent militer et peuvent soutenir la question de l'abolition la, de, de peine de mort C'est très simple, il faut faire un appel. Ça, ça, veut, ça veut dire que moi, j'ai été convoquée pour assister et peut venir euh, euh, exposer mon expérience. Ça veut dire ici. Mais si on lance un appel, je suis sûre et certaine qu'il doit y avoir plusieurs moyennes et petites entreprises qui ont de la, la même vocation et qui peuvent militer. Il suffit de faire un appel ou et après s'organiser en réseau. Parce que quand on est nombreux, on a plus de chances et on a plus de chances de réussir, comme le réseau des parlementaires contre la peine de mort et le réseau des avocats. Pourquoi pas un réseau des, des entrepreneurs Et pour faciliter cette tâche, je ne sais pas, moi j'ai un petit concept, c'est qu'il faut envisager, il faut chercher à atteindre les chambres de commerce dans différents pays et les chambres de commerce qui sont représentées dans trois pays. Parce qu'il y a plusieurs sociétés, plusieurs entreprises qui sont membres. Donc si on peut faire des activités dans les chambres de commerce et inviter les entreprises à assister, on peut constituer, on peut diffuser et on peut former un réseau des abolitionnistes parce qu'on ne fait pas l'exception. Il y en a vraiment. Et la question de la corruption, on peut la traiter aussi. On ne peut pas défendre les droits de l'homme, on ne peut pas défendre, on ne peut pas soutenir l'abolition et 
on ne peut pas euh, aussi parler de la corruption et aussi avoir des entreprises citoyennes qui respectent les droits de l'homme et les chartes, une, la charte universelle des droits humains. Merci. That's a fantastic point to end on. Thank you so much. So we've got a network of business leaders is, is what we need for this and engaging the Chambers of Commerce. So it's been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to the interpreters and to all the panelists. Of course, come and talk to them or talk to them outside if you have further questions. Oui, tout à fait. J'espère qu'elle était là ce matin. Elle est montée là ce matin.